Hello, we welcome clinicians, and welcome to another case review. This is Ali Nessa, and I'm joined today by Dr. Dirk Gersnich, an endodontist and educator practicing in Houston, Texas. Dr. Gersnich is a faculty member at the OSF GPR program in Peoria, Illinois, and is also an adjunct faculty at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center at Houston School of Dentistry. Uh, Dr. Gersnich, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. So you have a uh, multi-part presentation called Intentional Replantation, Saving the Hopeless Natural Teeth. Now, as you know, I'm obviously a very big advocate of this very helpful procedure, and I believe that it's uh, very underutilized in our profession. Uh, of course, the key to success, as always, like any other procedure, is case selection and also correct execution of this somewhat technique-sensitive procedure. So why don't you please proceed to talk about some of these cases that you've chosen for us today uh, and describe this technique, and we can describe some of the treatment planning and case selection details uh, along the way and also at the end. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about this first case that you have for us. Absolutely. So, you know, the, the main thing is case selection, uh, informed consent. Uh, this is a first-line procedure, um, but it's definitely something that we have in our arsenal to use when people really want to save their teeth, which we, we which we highly advocate for. So it's kind of finding the the right the right tooth, the right patient, just kind of the right situation. Uh, and this is kind of the last route that we use to help people save their teeth. So it's not not just something you jump into without trying other means first, or or analyzing the case and kind of going through your treatment alternatives. Uh, this first patient, uh, he presented to an emergency clinic that I was staffing. Uh, he presented with uh, his dental history with the millogenesis imperfecta. He has multiple missing teeth and rather poor oral hygiene. Uh, and he presented originally in the clinic for emergency pulpectomy on number 15. And uh, endodontic therapy was finished in May of 2014 by a faculty member at the, uh, at the university. So in November when I saw him, he presented, he was very swollen, um, large abscess. Uh, he was definitely interested in saving his uh, last molar for as long as possible. First day we uh, decided, seeing as it had been treated you know, multiple times, to go on and take a cone beam just to see what was going on, just because the periapical radiograph, it, it looked kind of suspicious to us. Uh, it looked like there might be something going on than just your typical molar. Uh, at that visit, we also performed an incision and drainage. Um, and then just kind of, we'll just go back through some of the x-rays here. So this first visit was in April of 2014, and you can see um, endo had not been completed at this point. And then we have a couple uh, uh, initial radiographs here. Here's just another view of that tooth before it received its initial therapy. So this was after the therapy. This was actually the first day that I'd seen this patient here in November of 2014. And you can see the, the radiolucency. Um, which was uh, what he presented with, with the swelling. And just another view that same day. Um, so you can see that it looks kind of atypical. It looks a little little short filled there, especially on the palatal. So we took the, so then we moved on, we took the cone beam x-ray. And then from the cone beam you can see a large lesion that's uh, basically around where the palatal and the distal roots uh, are together, extending all the way to the mesial root. And what was really interesting to us here is in between the distal buckle and the palatal canal, uh, you can see basically a, a black area that's an isthmus. And that isthmus is something that we knew we couldn't, couldn't clean going in and retreating. Um, so you start to think the surgical route, start to head that route. But a lot of times, and in the literature, it's really hard for us to, to visualize and clean these surgically. So that's why we started thinking that with this root structure that the intentional replantation uh, might be the route to go. Uh, intentional replantation would also allow us to be able to visualize, um, you know, if there was a fracture or what was going on. Uh, surgically, sometimes we can see that, sometimes we can't. So we knew in this case that the retreatment would not eliminate the etiology because of this atypical anatomy and that even this ap apical surgery would be challenging to clean the, the isthmus thoroughly. So here's an interoral um, picture um, before we were starting treatment. So you can clearly see the amylogenesis imperfecta. Uh, and you can see that this tooth uh, still has a temporary restoration, had not been restored at this point. 
And so here's just another picture. This is just me. So at the beginning of these treatments, I put them all through the same protocol. But we just do a little light, super gingival um, debridement. Uh, I'm not going very, very far into the gum tissue, but I'm just eliminating any sorts of bacteria that could get in there and, and possibly, um, you know, cause our treatment not to work or uh, longer to heal. So after we have them rinsed with Paradex, and uh, you know, we do kind of our debridement. Obviously, we've anesthetized. Then we get into the um, extraction portion. And the main thing is having our armamentarium set up. So I have my microscope set up. I have my burrs set up. I have my ultrasonic set up with the ultrasonic instrument that I want to clean with. Um, I have my save a tooth set up where I'm going to put this tooth immediately after removing. I, I you know, the main thing is having the armamentarium set up. And you want this tooth out of the mouth uh, the least amount of time possible, ideally, is, is under 10 minutes. Um, which, you know, gives us an ad advantage being set up versus, um, you know, in the past where this procedure might have been done after a trauma uh, where, you know, things aren't set up. It's not an ideal situation. So, you know, that's where we're getting higher success with this treatment when we have a prepared armamentarium versus in prior times in the literature where they kind of loop, you know, lumped it all together with these trauma cases and not knowing where the tooth had been and how it had been treated while it was out of the mouth. So anyways, going forward, so we're doing the extraction basically as atraumatic as possible. So it's mostly just four step elevation to remove it. You're not wanting to, uh, to elevate much. You're not wanting to, uh, to scrape the PDL at all because um, we, we want to make sure that everything can, you know, we can get the best chance for healing. So the main thing is trying to keep the cells viable on the ligament space while it's out. As you can see here, we've gripped a little bit deeper on the tooth than ideal. Um, ideally, you don't want to be touching the, uh, the root space at all. However, the compromised status of this tooth with the milligenesis imperfecta, uh, we decided that you know, to go a little bit deeper just to kind of grab it and have it was, was going to give us a better chance than if we were to grip it higher on a tooth, which might be more ideal, but the tooth fracture and have no chance of reimplanting. So as I had stated earlier, we have the save a tooth kit. We immediately want to put it in there, and that helps keep those cells viable while, uh, while we're doing our procedure. And that's just basically the Hanks Balance Salt solution. So you can see we're putting it in there immediately. We have the gauze with the Hanks Balance Salt solution. And uh, you'll see throughout the procedure, whenever I'm holding and working on the tooth, I have, you know, I have that Hanks Balance Salt solution save a tooth. Um, so gauze wrapped around the coronal portion that I'm holding, and then uh, um, anytime it's anytime I'm not holding it, I put it back in this apparatus to, to keep the cells uh, soaked in that solution. So after I removed it, I, I quickly went in and went as far apical um, just to see if there was any sort of uh, um, lesion that I could kind of scoop out. Uh, you know, there's some cases we've actually scooped out like a big old blob of uh, um, tissue. Um, one case, you know, turned out to be actinomycosis. So we do send that out for biopsy. However, you want to make sure that you're not scraping any of the walls in here that uh, could disrupt uh, our PDL cells. So you can see here, I have the, the gauze uh, soaked in the Hanks salt solution. I went ahead, and at this point, this is where I'm basically performing my root resection. So you can see that I'll, I'll just cut straight across the tooth uh, with water spray and obviously a good assistant to help you out and soak all that up. And as we get further down on the tooth, you can start to see the dark area on that distal and palatal root where that bacteria was hiding, and that's basically the isthmus of the, of the tooth. So once I had removed the root and exposed the gutta percha, uh, we were able to start to move forward with our staining, uh, which is standard protocol. We still want to stain to make sure we're not seeing any sort of fractures, um, which would necessitate us most likely just leaving the tooth extracted. And the patient was aware of that going into the procedure, that that's a possibility. So after the staining, went ahead and uh, went in with our ultrasonics and started to uh, remove the gutta percha as well as clean any bacteria in this case that was caught in that isthmus, as well as anywhere um, along that preparation. So we're using ultrasonic, rinsing under some saline rinses here. And uh, we, want, we don't want to overheat the tooth. 
So again, just another picture of us just cleaning out. Uh, and you can see I'm clearly holding it with that uh, soap gauze as well. And for speeding things up, in this case, we went ahead and got in there with a the high speed to really open up that isthmus uh, faster. Uh, thinking the ultrasonic was taking us too much time, and, and time is of the essence in this procedure. So, and then we got back in there with the ultrasonic, and you can clearly see kind of the deep preparation, and, and now you can see the distal buckle and the palatal roots and kind of that isthmus combining uh, that we were in there cleaning out, uh, which turned out to be basically the source of that reinfection. And now I've jumped over to the mesial root to basically do the same thing with the ultrasonic. And here we're starting to pack in our, uh, our BC putty, our root repair material um, and sealer that we're, that we're using to seal the apex um, now that we've thoroughly cleaned everything. And just kind of gently packing it into place um, to seal that whole apex. And just another picture, you can see how we've you know, filled in the entire isthmus in this case. And there you can clearly see the mesial root. You can also see the isthmus filled in between the distal muffle and the palatal roots. And then we went ahead and cleaned up the excess, uh, make sure there's no sharp edges, anything like that that uh, could impede the healing process. You see here, I, you know, I, I work under the microscope as much as possible on, on all endodontic procedures. And this procedure, is, um, there's no, no real difference. We're able to look through the scope. We're able to visualize fractures. We're able to to see what we need to be cleaning out and, and rinsing out so we can get everything sealed properly. At this point, we went to uh, reinsert the tooth. Uh, just based on the anatomy of this tooth, I was having issues getting it back into place. So I, you know, I removed it again, um, and I had to go back in and basically surgically with the handpiece remove some of this interceptal bone to be able to get this tooth to fit back into place. So there you can see me removing that interceptal bone. Once I had that done, I was able just to use finger pressure uh, to reinsert the tooth and just finger pressure to uh, recompress the bone uh, around the tooth. So this is uh, immediate after post-op. You can see all the, the putty that's been packed in to seal off the apex. And uh, you can see that we've repositioned it where we wanted to reposition it. But so that's just another angle of our post-op immediate uh, reimplantation, and this is pretty impressive. At three months, we were already seeing basically that uh, the abscessed area had healed, and we're already starting to see bone bone filling in, which was uh, very encouraging at only the three-month post-op um, view. So I just took another angled X-ray at that three-month. And here we're at the five-month post-op. He had not been restored at this point. Uh, it's kind of a financial thing. I think he was waiting to heal. Uh, this is a case that I do have. Um, it's actually approaching a two-year follow-up. Um, and we'll see in, in future x-rays here that we, that we have that and the tooth has been uh, rebuilt. Um, and I'm not, uh, not sure at what point he got the crown. All right, that's uh, that's great. That's uh, my only question was it seems like uh, there might be some adjacent decay on the premolar tooth as well. Uh, this patient, as well as you know, the restoration of this tooth and the tooth adjacent to it, uh, is that something that is going to be planned soon for this patient or uh, or not? Because I, I I do I heard you say that it was a financial constraint for the patient, but clearly uh, you know caries control would be obviously a priority here, right? Absolutely. Well, and, and when I get you the future x-rays, we will see that. Um, I, I actually went ahead and did the buildups for him to get these restored because um, I wanted to make sure he was able to save these teeth. Yeah. And, uh, so you mentioned to me that you had longer uh, recalls than five months as well on this already, right? Yep. This is the one I'm going to work on getting, getting those to you. Perfect. Terrific sound. So we can probably insert that. Um, into the presentation, so that that's the this is great. Um, um, you know, getting these maxillary molars out for ma uh, for intentional replantation is very difficult. For in my experience, I have seen the same issue that you experience with the replantation part of it, uh, which is having these septal bones uh, kind of interfere. I found as the maxillary bone is fairly spongy, you get this collapse of the socket after you extract the tooth. And then it's very difficult to reposition it. Um, 
the isthmuses that you uh, have seen with this fused distal buckle and uh, uh, paddle root is fairly common. We see that a lot in these maxillary first or even second molar is probably more common even in the second molar. Um, do you have you tried to treat these with apicoectomy instead of intentional replantation? Because I found that with the scope and having these longer, I noticed that you're using the Lindemann burr for cutting your making your cuts. Um, you can sometimes go through the buckle almost in a trans buckle approach and get to the paddle or root. Uh, especially if the patient has good enough access, you could visualize it and prepare the prep. And Phil, have you tried that? Uh, sure, and I, yeah, I have. I had good surgical experience during my residency. Mm -hmm. um, the case here, we were we were thinking that there very well could be a fracture, and mm -hmm. you know it was just basically a situation cost wise for this guy it was cheaper for us to do this procedure than go through and and do an apico and then possibly have to do the extraction. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of one of those combination, you know, cases that. Mm -hmm. uh, we chose to go this route. Now, in terms of atraumatic extraction, uh, how do you define that? Obviously, you know, we want to remove these teeth with minimum amount of trauma to the live PDL cells on the root so that they could be preserved and then regenerate the PDL after repositioning. But what are some of the tricks you've learned for doing your replantation or extraction portion of this as atraumatically as possible? Basically, as atraumatically as possible, yeah, I mean, like you're saying, an extraction atraumatic is kind of a, a pun there, but uh, um, the atraumatic is, is mostly just, uh, it's a lot of just pressure, just getting those ligaments just to loosen up enough for that tooth to be able to come out. And so it's just a lot of uh, buccal lingual pressure, and then it's also just some slight, um, basically, rotations, just kind of clockwise, counterclockwise, and just basically not forcing it and, and, and taking time. So it's just mostly just applying that pressure for more of a prolonged period of time that I found. And, you know, practicing for, you know, eight years as a general dentist and doing tons of extractions, um, you get fairly proficient at the extractions. And it's definitely a side of dentistry that I enjoy. And so it's just kind of the experience of doing it. Although in those cases, you were probably using an elevator more because you weren't going right. to put the tooth right. back in. So it's mostly just trying to get that bone just to kind of widen, I guess you could say, kind of loosen up um, just enough to get that out of there without, um, you know, without, I guess, basically traumatizing the PDL cells. Um, I mean, that, that's basically what I mean by traumatic is, is minimal disruption, uh, you know, of those cells. Mm -hmm. As yeah. I mean, I, I found that minimizing the use of elevators, any of the um, um, instruments that would potentially scrape, ditch, or damage the cementum and the root surface would should be avoided if possible. Of course, it's easier said than done. I found many teeth that you end up having intentional replantation are already structurally compromised coronally with crowns and a number of restorations. So just merely using forceps at the coronal level isn't so easy. I mean, the most common thing is the crown pops off as soon as you uh, start to uh, rock the tooth back and forth with the um, with the elevator, uh, not the elevator, but with the forceps. Um, but I found that it's a much, much slower process of extraction being atraumatic than the co conventional extraction technique. The conventional extraction technique, whether you find a path of withdrawal then it could be fairly quick by doing your apical pressure and then the buccolingual movement and then removing uh, across the path of extraction, oftentimes really expanding the sockets too much. Uh, I found that the trick with these would be to, uh, to take your time, be very slow with gentle uh, movements back and forth, um, not too much apical pressure because that clearly, as we know, it's the equivalent of, you know, of an intrusive a uh, type of a traumatic uh, event for the tooth. And that certainly does damage and kill the PDL cells by crushing them. But this lateral movement slowly and then gentle extraction, that's, you know, and sometimes you really do end up having to use minimum amount of elevator use as well. I found that you just sometimes just can't get away with it. Um, uh, which is why, to be honest, uh, uh, on the maxillary teeth, I try to minimize the uh, this type of a procedure to single root it or premolars that are maybe just two-rooted. I found with the molars, unless they're completely conical, 
it's a fairly difficult thing to replace them, put them back in. And, you know, if we end up having to widen the socket and, you know, cut off the bone, sometimes that becomes uh, a little bit more difficult. In terms of the use of ultrasonics compared to uh, the handpiece, um, do you, I mean, I saw that you use kind of both here. I found at the beginning, I used to use the ultrasonic a lot, but I found that, you know, using like a quarter or a half round burr on a high speed or even on a low speed is much faster. Don't you, have you found that too? Absolutely. Yeah, that's why, especially once I was in this and I was doing ultrasonic, I'm like, okay, this is not going to be time efficient. You know, time, time is yeah. of the end. So we just need to... Get and that's really the key thing you just said. Time is of essence in this procedure. And anything that you do to expedite the procedure, which means you have to have complete preparation in advance. You can't be looking for anything. Everything has to be laid out. Absolutely. And sometimes, you know, in dentistry, we have to kind of... You know, you have to work on the fly. You have to, you know, as it's going, you're like, hey, this isn't going quick enough. I have to know in my mind what I was going to do for my for my second plan. And so I knew exactly what I was going to do prior to that. You know, you have to, it's just like in sports, you got to be prepared. Uh, you got to have that plan B. If plan A is not going exactly as you need it to be going, then you got to have, you got to have an alternative because this isn't just like a, a little filling where you can just step away, take a break, try to try to rebond it or dry it. I mean, this tooth's got to get back in the mouth. So you, you yeah. got to be working quick and efficient. Yeah, every minute that passes by, the survivability of those PDL cells is uh, dramatically lowered, which will actually reduce your long-term prognosis and potential for, you know, resorptive events and things like that to take place. Uh, although I found when you are doing these fairly quickly, I really haven't had issues with resorption or any of those uh, potential, um, you know, negative side effects that could happen in some cases, as long as, again, the extraction process is atraumatic and the extra oral time is minimum. Uh, I saw that you were using the putty in an incremental um, condensation technique. I found also that, again, the lid technique, which I've uh, talked about quite a bit, is also a far faster way of filling these by simply injecting the sealer or the RRM material into the preparation and then quickly just putting a cap of the facet putty on top of it to protect it so it doesn't set, um, so it doesn't wash out, and then putting the tooth back in. Using these combination of using the handpiece and the, um, the lid technique, be, my extra oral time now, is, my goal is to be less than five minutes. Absolutely. And I found that it does help quite a bit. Well, that was great, and thank you so much for joining uh, me and sharing this case, and uh, let's come back and uh, do another case uh, right after this. Thank you. I was joined today by Dr. Derek Gersnich, uh, a faculty member at the OSF GPR program in Peoria, Illinois, and also adjunct faculty at the University of Texas Health and Sciences Center at uh, Houston School of Dentistry, and uh, also in private endodontic practice in Houston, uh, Texas. For Rebel Denda, I'm Ali Nese, and I hope you found this information helpful.